Hello BookTube. I have a quick Wednesday mega stuff video for you here. Just a few things to mention. I haven't seen my mail boy to find out his reading progress. But I did want to give you a tech update. Uh, because my life is full of tech, even though I'm not very good at it. Uh, I mentioned the other day, yesterday I think, that uh, my surly houseboy was able at a moment to fix the clog, the stop, on my Nook app on my, uh, my great iPad 7 of 9. Fantastic. Absolutely. I don't know how he did it. He doesn't know how he did it, but it, it's all working. That app is working fine now, so that's wonderful. But in the meantime, I got a new piece of tech that I wanted to show you and briefly talk about. As if it weren't obvious already that I am the coolest person on BookTube, you now have tangible proof because I got a burner phone. <laughs> I got a $15 cell phone. Uh, and I admit, the, the main reason that I got it was because my iPhone, uh, I got an iPhone 6S, my iPhone 7S died, it just bricked on me, no idea why, no one can explain it, no one can get it back. Uh, I, so I bought an iPhone 6S, I like the size of it better, I got a huge amount of storage on it, and it works just fine, but it's on its third SIM card, and in all three cases, it absolutely refuses to connect me with AT&T, it actually refuses to connect me with any kind of service that will turn it into an actual phone. <laughs> it works for everything else, but it won't make phone calls. And I've gone a long time, since March, without being able to make phone calls. And, you know, I don't make many phone calls. I don't receive many phone calls, but it is still a nice ability to have. Uh, and it seemed to me forever and ever, because I wasn't thinking straight, it seemed to me forever and ever that the way to do that, the way to get that fixed, was to bring the phone to a cell phone dealership in downtown Boston and just wait around in Plague Center. <laughs> wait around for the shop guy to have time to talk to me and maybe give me a SIM card that will work or figure out why this isn't working at all. And naturally, since March, I haven't wanted to do that. Even with a mask on, I haven't wanted to go and sit for two hours waiting for some slack-jawed loser with visible neck tattoos to help me with a minor tech issue. So I was thinking, well, okay, you, uh, you've bought two SIM cards for this thing already, hoping that it was the SIM card that was the problem. You put one, you take the old one out, put the new one in, still doesn't connect you to anything. So what are you going to do? Just going to keep going without the ability to make a phone call? And then I thought, no, that doesn't stop Colombian drug dealers, so why should it stop me? <laughs> so, so I went online and typed in prepaid cell phones, and lo and behold, this thing comes with 16 gigs of storage, it comes with its own SIM card, and with an activation sequence that does not require anything other than just a quick phone call on this device. To activate this for, you know, a plan of $15 a month that gives me the ability to make phone calls, gives me a phone number. And when I ordered this thing for $15, I thought, all right, well, that's what you'll use it for. You'll use your iPhone for everything else, because what will a $15 phone be able to do? Might be able to take phone calls. But other than that, and I was wrong completely wrong. I now don't don't know why anybody would buy an iPhone. Why would anybody spend more than $15 on a cell phone? This thing has the same processor, the same camera, the same refresh rate as my Kindle Fire. It's a perfectly serviceable front and back camera. It comes with the Google Play Store. It, it, it's a little bit slower moving things around on it than, than the iPhone. A little bit. But it can take pictures and send them to Instagram, it can take notes, it can do receive and send emails, it can download every app that I could possibly want, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Tumblr and whatnot. That'll work just fine on this thing. It costs $15. So, <laughs> so I'm not 100% sure. I, I have to explore the world of prepaid phones because I'm not 100% sure now why people would spend $400, $500, $1,200 on a new iPhone. This is, granted, it's smaller than the iPhone X, uh, but it's it's the, uh, slightly bigger than my, my uh, iPhone 6S. It's almost the same size as my iPhone 7S, and it does absolutely everything that that phone did. So once again, I'm wondering if the thing, the driving factor here, isn't gaming. Probably this thing is a piece of junk for video gaming. Probably that is true. Uh, and maybe that's the reason. I, I've noticed that that's the reason, for instance, in older laptops. Is that once the graphics card is outdated, 
the machine can still do wonders and no one's going to want it because 95% of the people who want these things want them for, for video games. That's how I've been able to get my last five MacBooks for dirt cheap because their graphics card is outdated, a part of the machine I'm never going to use. Probably that's true here. I'm also, uh, I'm also under the impression that one of the ways that the manufacturers of these things keep the price down is because they want to make the money back with coverage plans. And I haven't explored that yet. I haven't actually set up this as a phone yet. I've set it up in every other way. It works just fine in every other way. Uh, but I haven't actually set it up to have a phone number and whatnot. So we'll see how that goes. I will report back. Uh, but other than that, there's just mail. And it's a, it's, a, it's a big box. But it's not from one of you. It's not another gift. It's just, it's a big box. And it's not rattling around. So I have a feeling this is one big book. Uh, maybe a big finished copy. So let's, let's take a look. Uh, see what we have here. Uh, oh, no. Okay. Nope. Uh, it wasn't rattling around, but it is multiple books. Uh, what you doing, baby? Oh, there's a... Oh, what's she doing? She has been extremely sleepy all day. Extremely sleepy. I'm, uh, I had an appointment first thing this morning, so I had to go out. Uh, and when I came back, she went thermonuclear, of course. Happy to see you. Uh, but aside from that, she's been extremely sleepy all day, and that usually has only one explanation. Usually that means it's going to rain. Uh, so we shall see. <laughs> let's see if that's true. But for, for now, let's see. Let's see what we have here. We've got a box of hardcovers. Great. So uh, the, no, no dates on any of these, no pub sheets, but that's all right. The first one is by Carla Gardina Pestana, and it is The World of Plymouth Plantation. Neat little hardcover of the world of Plymouth Plantation. The English settlement at Plymouth has usually been seen in isolation. Indeed, the colonists gain our admiration in part because we envision them arriving on a desolate, frozen shore, far from assistance, and forced to endure a deadly first winter alone. Yet Plymouth was, from its first year, a place connected to other places. Going beyond the tales we learned from school books, the author offers an illuminating account of life in Plymouth Plantation. The colony was embedded in a network of trade and sociability. The Wampanoag, whose abandoned village the new arrivals used for their first settlement, were the first among many people the English encountered and upon whom they came to rely. The colonists interacted with fishermen, merchants, investors, and numerous others who passed through the region. Plymouth was thereby linked to England, Europe, the Caribbean, Virginia, the American interior, and the coastal points of West Africa. Okay, fantastic. So, what is it there? What is it, baby girl? Oh, you want another tennis ball, don't you? <laughs> no, this is just books, baby. This is just books. I'm sorry. This is just books. There are no tennis balls in here. <laughs> oh, I'll give her two of that once. She's going to want it forever. I was worried about that. Uh, so, we'll see what the date on this is. I imagine it's close to Thanksgiving, but uh, I'm always up for another book on the Plymouth Plantation. Absolutely. Then we have this next one. Let's see here. Frank Pasquale, uh, The New Laws of Robotics, Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI. Right up my alley. Right up my alley. Again, no date on it, but we you can, you can easily look these things up. Uh, let's see here. Too many CEOs tell a simple story about the future of work. If a machine can do what you do, your job will be automated. They envision everyone from doctors to soldiers rendered superfluous by ever more powerful AI. They offer stark alternatives. Make robots or be replaced by them. And that, as an opening, could not be more true. And doctors are already largely super, too superfluous in a lot of aspects that once they ruled. And soldiers? Maybe you saw that little clip of a video that went around social media just last week of a bunch of people in a car encountering a robotic dog on the sidewalk. A yellow thing with black legs just walking along the sidewalk. And they were cooing to it. Oh, look at you. Oh, aren't you cute? It stopped. It scanned them. It, it assessed whether or not it needed to do something, and then it decided it didn't and walked on. They should have been terrified. They should have driven the car right over it. And instead, no. <laughs> no, they didn't. Uh, imagine 15,000 of those. Uh, imagine you've got a, a terrorist cell, you know, in Tripoli somewhere, holed up in an apartment building, 
and you're holding off on raiding the place because you're worried about how many men you'll lose. Well, send a thousand of those things. They can climb the walls outside the building. You can drop them onto the surface, onto the roof, without worrying about anything like that. They can walk in the front door. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, another story is possible. In virtually every walk of life, robotic systems can make labor more valuable, not less. The author tells the story of nurses, teachers, designers, and others who partner with technologists rather than meekly serving as data sources for their computerized replacements. This cooperation reveals the kind of technological advance that would bring us all better health care, education, and more while maintaining meaningful work. These partnerships also show how law and regulation can promote prosperity for all rather than a zero-sum race of humans against machines. Okay, the new law of robotics. New laws of robotics. Uh, fine by me. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so that's two in a row that are on subjects that interest me. Uh, oh, my. Oh, goodness gracious. Goodness gracious. Okay. Uh, this is by Stephen Wertheim, and this is Tomorrow the World, the Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. Very nice cover. This is a cover subject matter. You could easily put an out-of-focus, blurry, old sapia tone photograph here, and you didn't. Very good. Uh, Stephen Wertheim is uh, young. He's very young. And he's the Deputy Director of Research and Policy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and Research Scholar at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. Uh, okay, so this is... What have we got here? For most of its history, the United States avoided making political and military commitments that would entangle it in European-style power politics. Then suddenly it conceived a new role for itself as the world's armed superpower, and never looked back. In this book, the author traces America's transformation to the, uh, to the crucible of World War II, especially in the months prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. As the Nazis conquered France, the architects of the nation's new foreign policy came to believe that the United States ought to achieve primacy in international affairs forevermore. Scholars have struggled to explain the decision to pursue global supremacy. Some deny that American elites made a willing choice, casting the United States as a reluctant power that sloughed off isolationism only after all potential competitors lay in ruins. That's nonsense. <laughs> so I'm glad that's only being considered instead of asserted. Uh, others contend that the United States has, had always coveted global dominance and realized its ambition at the first opportunity. Both views are wrong. As late as 1940... The small coterie of officials and experts who composed the U.S. foreign policy class either wanted British preeminence in global affairs to continue or hoped that no power would dominate. As late as 1940, maybe. But shortly after that, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted the British Empire. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe they're not considering him as part of the, uh, the global affairs class. The war, however, swept away that assumption, leading leading them to conclude that the United States should extend its form of law and order across the globe and back it at gunpoint. Wertheim argues that no one favored isolationism, term introduced by advocates of armed supremacy in order to turn their own cause into the definition of new internationalism. We now live, the author warns, in the world that these men created. A sophisticated and impassioned narrative that questions the wisdom of U.S. supremacy. Tomorrow, the world reveals the intellectual path that brought us to today's global entanglements and endless wars. Oh, my. Okay, well, uh, the author is a policy walk, so this will be detailed. This will, be, this will not be a, a breezy Bill O'Reilly type thing. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, dare I do it? Dare I do it? Let us let us check for a couple of names in the back. Uh, okay, William Howard Taft gets three mentions, and let's see. Let's turn to Dulles. Uh, oh God, uh, John Foster Dulles gets eight mentions. Okay. <laughs> well, I can't wait. And then the last one. Then we have the last book in here in this box. Uh, what have we got here? All right, it's four for four. Boy, oh boy, fantastic. This is by Beatrice Grundler, and this is The Rise of the Arabic Book. A great subject. Ah, uh, let's see what we have here. During the 13th century, Europe's largest library owned fewer than 2,000 volumes. 
I don't know where this is going. Libraries in the Arab world at the time had exponentially larger collections. Five libraries in Baghdad alone held between 200,000 and 1 million books each, uh, including multiple copies of standard works so that their many patrons could enjoy simultaneous access. How did the Arabic Codex become so popular during the Middle Ages, even as the well-established form languished in Europe? The author's The Rise of the Arabic Book answers this question through in-depth stories of bookmakers and book collectors, stationers and librarians, scholars and poets of the 9th century. The history of the book has been written with an outsized focus on Europe. The role books played in shaping the great literary cultures of the world beyond the West has been less known until now. Well, it's, not, it's been less known, but it hasn't been uncovered. I've written about it several times for the English language newspaper in Abu Dhabi, The National. This is exactly the kind of book that I would pitch to them, and I will, but they have been hit pretty hard by COVID cutbacks and don't do a lot of uh, freelance book coverage anymore. Uh, so we shall see. But one way or another, over the, over the course of writing for them for 11, 12 years, I did an enormous amount more Arabic-based reading than I would probably otherwise have done, and it had created uh, a sweet tooth in me. I now actually l look forward to these books, whether I can pitch them or not. Uh, so, and this is a perfect example. Fantastic. Uh, okay, great. Well, <laughs> as a box of books goes, you couldn't do much better than this. Fantastic. So Harvard University Press and the Belknap Press at Harvard University Press hit it out of the park. So we have The Rise of the Arabic Book. We have Tomorrow the World, about the rise of America as the determinant world power uh, until 2016. Uh, we have New Laws of Robotics, The Rise of Robots. <laughs> uh, and we have The World of Plymouth Plantation, The, the Rise of the Plymouth Plantation. How, what it was really like. Not the mythology that you get at the tourist center, but what it was really like. Uh, so that's great. Fantastic. So you have uh, four new books, probably all October and November releases, and a burner phone. <laughs> so that's your, that's your mega stuff update for today. There might be more mail today. Uh... We'll see if there is, if there's not much of it, I'll hold it over to tomorrow. We'll do a mega stuff video then. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.